Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Today we're looking at another flexible mat. So this one is made by Yegring. I think I've pronounced that right. It's Y-E-G-R-I-N. My apologies if I haven't. It's a two foot by one foot flexible panel. Uh, it has an exoskeleton. It weighs about one and a half kilograms. That's the weight of the whole unit that I'm holding here. Um, and the point of difference between this and other mats that we've looked at is you can use this one out in the rain. All right, so let's run through what you get in the kit. So this thing sells for about 2,000 Australian dollars, which is quite a lot of money for a one by two mat, but it's not your average one by two mat. Um, you'll see a bit later on where the build quality, uh, where the dollars are going. So basically in the kit, you get a transformer or a power supply. Now the power supply does have a push-in connector, so you can connect it fairly quickly. Now, if you want a little bit more security, it will thread up so it won't come loose. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. Now you also get the uh, controller. Now the controller has a V-lock mount directly onto the back. So um, pretty much if you're running it off batteries, uh, that's all you need to do uh, and you're off and running. Now in terms of mounting this, it does have a string mount. Now I hate these. Um, I think they're a pain, you know, it bounces around when you move it, it's very dangerous, I think. Now, um, as well as that, it does have a thread here, a standard thread to, to put a TV spigot into. So basically if I was using this, I'd put a spigot in the side and then I'd mount it uh, with a super clamp to my stand. That would be uh, my preference uh, on how to mount this to operate it. Now you also get a double ball mount. Now the double ball mount's pretty good because it enables you to get a, a tilt all the way down, gives you a lot of angle of operation. Now with the ball mount also, you can uh, use it to rotate, so you can go horizontal, vertical. And um, the other thing you get is uh, basically, the light comes in this bag. So I'll just uh, turn this off so I don't blind you when we have a look. So the light comes in this zippable bag. Now they say don't, um, don't take the panel out. Uh, or don't un un unzip it to have a look inside. Of course, that just tempted me and I had a look inside. So basically this, this is to protect the, uh, the light and also give it its waterproofing. Now, before we go any further, it's very important to point out that the mat here in its bag has an IP54 rating, which means it can be exposed to jets of water from all directions, but the controller is not waterproof. Now, continuing um, through the kit, you also get a plastic diffuser, which um, Looks a little bit naff when you first see it, but it's actually not that bad. Now, before I put the diffuser on, I just want to show you something with the front, because this is 100 watts, so there's a, there's a lot of LEDs. Now, um, the LEDs are quite tightly packed together, so you don't really get multiple shadowing. So, um, I'll just turn this on. So the reason I'm saying that is you probably, uh, in day-to-day -day operation, you'll probably never use the diffuser, because um, you don't really get uh, multiple shadowing. Uh, again, that's because the LEDs are so tightly dense and they're uh, densely packed together and they're done in a, uh, in a checkerboard formation so, um, so you don't get rows of light. Um, but we'll go through the diffuser in a sec. And the next thing I'll just point out is uh, you've got what I call the exoskeleton. So if you haven't seen one of these before, uh, basically the, the skeleton on the outside packs down, uh, just folds up and packs down and it literally just slots onto the mat. So if you want to use the mat as a separate standalone mat, um, you can do that. So it just, it just removes from this. Now, in terms of the mat, it's, uh, it's flexible, but I wouldn't try and fold it. And I wouldn't try and fold it because you would damage the heat sink. So there is some uh, heat dissipation material in here. Okay, so let's run through getting the mat on and show you the diffuser. So the mat is quite easy to uh, get onto the exoskeleton. So quite literally just, um, just extend it or flex it and, uh, and it's on. So you've gone from, um, from being a uh, flexible mat now to having a, a rigid form uh, light. Um, now let's put the uh, diffuser on. So the diffuser literally Velcros onto the back. I'm not a huge fan of this diffuser, I've got to say how it mounts. Uh, because you don't have Velcro right up to the edge, because it, it, is, it is a beautifully finished bag, uh, by the way. Uh, but the problem is the, um, getting the diffuser on, the diffuser has its Velcro on the edge. So as you can see here, it's a little bit of a struggle to get, uh, to get a Velcro connection this side. It's hard to get your hand down and press it in, but once it's on, it's on. So the diffuser's okay as long as you're not shooting anything reflective. 
Now, if you were to shoot anything reflective, I'd suggest uh, having a uh, proper softbox. Um, they do sell a softbox. I have um, very limited information on that softbox other than these two photos. So I don't know what the dimensions are. Um, so look, that's, that's pretty much um, uh, the nuts and bolts of the unit. All right, so let's see what difference the diffuser actually makes. So I've put a light stand in here to cast a shadow. We've got the diffuser on. Now let's uh, rip the diffuser off. Okay, so it really doesn't do much because the, um, the LEDs are that tightly packed. It's a pretty soft light source anyway. Now let's talk about the controller and, uh, and go through the operation of the unit. Now initially the controller does look uh, a little bit plasticky, but the, um, the actual sides um, are aluminium or metal. Now in terms of turning it on, um, if you just press the power button, nothing happens. So it took me a little bit of time to figure this out um, because it didn't come with any instructions. Uh, basically you've got to hold the power button down uh, to turn it on. So I'm guessing they've done that so you can't accidentally turn the unit off moving it around. Um, so, so that's a good thing. Now on the side you've got two, uh, two rollers. So one for your uh, color temperature and the other roller is uh, for your brightness. Now these controllers uh, or these rollers are fantastically smooth and easy to use. So I'll just give you an example. So on the front here, we've got a display, which is very accurate and easy to read and, and tells you what you're doing. Let's go, let's pick a color temperature, 4,300. Okay, so basically, um, how easy was that? So we're at 4,300. So very easy to use controls. Um, our brightness dims in 1% increments. Let's pick a, a random brightness, say 76%. Okay, so here we go. And there we are, uh, 76 I said, didn't I? 76, bang, as easy as that. So uh, I've got to say, they're the easiest controls um, I've used on, um, on a small uh, unit like this. Uh, very precise and very smooth. Now, there is one thing I don't like about this unit. Now, apparently the unit has a DMX. Um, I can't test the DMX, I don't know if it works. And that's because they've used um, some weird plug here. It looks like a, an old telephone plug. Now I've got uh, five pin DMX, three pin DMX, RJ45 DMX. You know, how many different types of DMX do I need to carry? So I'm, I'm a bit annoyed at that. Um, look, I understand that this probably saves maybe 10 cents a unit when you're building it, but um, the end result is you don't get a review on your DMX because I'm sick of carrying adapter plugs for every single light that's out there. Now one thing I almost forgot to mention with the controller is it is soft start. What that means is when you turn it on, if you've got it set to full power, it doesn't just go thump up to 100%. Okay, so watch this. All right, now that's important with your batteries. I've got uh, other units, other flexible panels that just go straight to full power and that trips out the older batteries. Uh, now what's interesting here, I've been running this thing uh, all day off uh, the same V-Lock battery and the battery is about to go flat. And you can see here the display flashes. Now at 2000 Australian dollars, this does seem a bit expensive, but now you're going to see where the money is spent. So uh, the build quality of the mat's pretty good. So you've got this uh, lovely protective plastic. Now I want you to imagine this is one of my Aladdins and uh, this happened. Okay, so basically you don't have to worry about um, your lids getting ripped out or damaged when they're, when they're in the box. It's uh, definitely not going to happen. All of the uh, stitching on the edges is premium. It's, it's really stitched well. It's Velcro lined front and back. The edges are steel reinforced and are screwed in. Now also the cable entry is strongly reinforced, so that's not going to come loose. And if you do get a hard pull on it, it has a secondary disconnection point inside, so you can't rip the circuit board apart. Now if you have a look in between the LEDs, you can see it's got very big circuit tracks. So very little chance of you having to solder an LED connection joint. Now internally, the unit has a flexible copper sheet for its heat distribution. So it's not using any foil paper. It actually is going to last. And that's covered with a rubber, which is thin enough to allow the unit to flex, but thick enough that it can't be bent. And even the zip has a rubber shield protecting the tracks. All right, so let's get into the technical review and have a look at brightness first. So these measurements were taken at three meters. Now at 3,200 Kelvin, this thing spits out 311 lux. At 4,300 Kelvin, it spits out 218 lux. And at 5,600 Kelvin, it spits out 376 lux. Now the next thing I did was check the frequency. 
this thing is running at 17 kilohertz, which means it's pulsing 17,000 times a second. So if you've got a global shutter camera, you can shoot at hundreds of frames a second, thousands of frames a second, you're not gonna get a problem. However, if you've got a slow rolling shutter, that's not really fast enough. So at frame rates like 120 frames per second, you might get flicker. Now to illustrate this, I've taken a photo at an extremely high shutter speed with a rolling shutter camera, and you can see the flicker. Next up, let's have a look at how accurate the CCT is. So this was taken from 33 measurements, 100 Kelvin apart. Now in the warm whites, that's anything below 4000 Kelvin, this thing was accurate to plus or minus 86 Kelvin. In the mid range, that's 4000 to 5000 Kelvin, this thing was typically reading under at an average of 334 Kelvin. Now in your cool whites, that's anything above 5000 Kelvin, this thing is accurate, typically under, by an average of 232 Kelvin. Now let's talk about purity of whites. This thing hits the Planckian curve in its warm whites at 3000 Kelvin. At 3200 degrees Kelvin, it is barely imperceivably pink. It is actually 0.0011 DUV under the Planckian curve. So in real terms, that is so close to pure white that you can't correct it with any correction gels. At 4300 degrees Kelvin, it is its furthest linear track away from the Planckian curve at 0.0031 DUV, which is ever so slightly more than a 1 8th correction gel. Now this thing hits pure white when you dial in 5,600 degrees Kelvin. According to one of my meters, it is 0.0003 above the Planckian curve. And according to my other meter, it is 0.0001 below the Planckian curve. So let's split it and say this thing hits pure white when you dial in 5,600 Kelvin. All right, so let's take a closer look at our common usage Kelvins. Okay, when you dial in 3,200 Kelvin, you get 3,133 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 99. Now here are the individual CRI scores, and with the exception of R12 scoring 86.8%, all the rest score above 95, with an overall average of 97.7. Color vector testing, however, reveals a more accurate score would be 95%, with an average saturation of 101%. And the graphic indicates very minimal color skewing. Here is the spectrum graph, and it is typical of an LED trying to emulate tungsten light. Now, if you want to get closer to 3200 Kelvin, try dialing in 3300. Now let's have a look at 4300 Kelvin. When you dial in 4300 Kelvin, you get 4002 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 99%. Here are the individual CRI scores. R12 is the weakest at 79.4. R9 comes in at 88.7. R15 is pretty strong at 93.9 and everything else is above 95, giving us an overall average of 97%. Color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 92%, with a 101% average saturation. Now with the exception of one marker index, all the other indexes indicate minimal skewing. Here is the spectrum analysis. Now if you want to get closer to 4300 Kelvin, dial in 4700 Kelvin. Now, last but not least, let's look at 5,600 Kelvin. When you dial in 5,600 Kelvin, you get 5,438 with a TLCI score of 98%. Here are the individual CRI scores and with the exception of R12 at 75.9%, everything else scores 94 plus, giving an overall average of 97.4. TM30 color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 92% with 100% saturation. The color graph indicates slight skewing, but nothing to be concerned about. And here is the spectrum graph. Now, if you wanna get closer to 5,600 degrees Kelvin, try dialing in 5,700 degrees Kelvin. I'm Andrew Locke, see you on the next episode of Gaffering Gear.